A grisly discovery at a railroad crossing marks the beginning of a mystery that will go unsolved for years. All I had is some decomposed muscle. It was pretty much all skeletonized. Ghost stories, witchcraft, and a little girl crying murder muddy the waters in a case where even the most basic questions are puzzles. We didn't see a penis, we didn't see a vagina, there was no internal organs, you couldn't see the sex. Can Dr. G find the evidence needed to put a killer behind bars? Then, Henry Clark drops dead moments after coming home from the store. The groceries were still in the plastic bag. He never put them away. Were warning signs overlooked? We've got some funny marks here that look like needle puncture marks in his left arm. And could his death have been prevented? Altered lives, baffling medical mysteries, shocking revelations. These are the everyday cases of Dr. G, medical examiner. When Dr. G begins work on an autopsy, she is often driven by a sense of responsibility to the living. Again, I'm so sorry. The groceries were but so medical sorry. examiners must also use their expertise to help the deceased themselves, to right a wrong, like to bring a killer to justice. Doctor. The core function of medical examiners to always be suspicious that there's not foul play involved in the death that a homicide uh, isn't being missed. That's gonna be our core function. That's really kind of why we exist. I mean, honestly, if it was just to diagnose uh, heart disease in the community, we probably wouldn't be funded. I mean, the bottom line. That is precisely the service Dr. G was called on to perform in 1995, while she was serving as a medical examiner in Bear County, Texas. The investigation launched that summer became known as the case of the Haunted Rail Crossing. In August of that year, at a rural San Antonio railway crossing, a dog picks up a scent. Investigating, it finds a pile of bones, human bones. Under the searing heat of the Texas sun, the skeleton is almost completely decomposed. A dog had actually picked up one of the skeletal bones and brought it to the, uh, the owner of the property up on the porch. Realizing what his dog has brought home, the owner immediately calls the police. The body, or what's left of it, is carefully collected by the field investigators of the Bear County Morgue taking care to photograph the exact position of the bones and then duplicating that placement in the body bag. They are then brought to Dr. G, and they come with a strange story. Initially, we got a call of a partially skeletonized body out by the railroad tracks. This is a very special area, and that this railroad track area was felt to be haunted. Of course, a local superstition doesn't concern Dr. G. The scarcity of remains do. I do some initial examination. All I had is some decomposed muscle. It was pretty much all skeletonized. It's dressed very oddly in an oversized man's t-shirt. I think some knit uh, shorts of some type. Dr. G's first order of business is to try to identify the corpse's age and sex, and then match those facts to reports of missing persons. As a person ages, the plates that make up certain skeletal structures, like the pelvis and the humerus, fuse. By looking at the thickness of the fused areas, Dr. G makes an educated guess at the age of the remains. Relatively young, I knew that, around 15 years old, but uh, the sex was very difficult, possibly because they were so young. Dr. G hopes that more physical remains are waiting to be found remains that could help determine the sex and ID the partial body lying in her morgue. She herself heads out to the supposedly haunted tracks. So I actually went back out to the scene. It was kind of like deliverance. There was a kind of on the porch with these big dogs and it was actually the big dogs that discovered this body because they brought the bones back to the guy on the porch that one day. 
So I'm in the car with my investigator and the dogs surround us. And I'm thinking, oh boy, they've already test, you know, tasted human flesh. I'm not coming out. So, <laughs> so finally the guy from the porch pulls the dogs away from the car. We go out, look for some more uh, teeth. I was able to find those and hair and uh, brought those back. But even with the new evidence, the secret of these bones stays secret. Dr. G can't be sure how the person died. We cleaned the bones up, then looked very carefully for trauma. We x-ray and couldn't find any uh, trauma to the bones either. Very little can be certain with such partial remains, even the body sex. It just didn't have a lot of good sexual characteristics. This Facial features were somewhat ambiguous. No genitalia that had been decomposed. We didn't see a penis, we didn't see a vagina. There was no internal organs. You couldn't see the sex. But we thought the DNA would be a good way to go. Initial examination looked like it was a female to me. So the autopsy report said, and it is read as, the skeleton looks female, but a DNA uh, revealed that it was a male. Based on skull structure, an artist's sketch hints at what the male victim may have looked like I had actually tried to compare it to some other people who were missing. Some people came in and said, oh, it looks like this person or that person, and none of those panned out. You don't want to get any more damaged. Huh? And so I just sat in our office for a long time. We didn't identify it. We didn't know who it was. But some hundred miles away, a 12-year-old girl in a state youth center thinks she knows who it is. The girl is Sandra Rodriguez, recently removed from an abusive home. One night, she sees a television news story about the discovery of a dead body. Sandra turns to her roommate casually and reportedly says, Oh, I'll bet that's my sister, Christy. My mother murdered her. Sandra then begins to tell authorities in the shelter a tale of neglect and abuse that begins over 90 miles southwest of San Antonio in Texas where she lived with her older sister, Christy, her mother, Elsie, and six other adults in a house owned by her mother's cousin, Linda. There's about nine people living there. You're looking at about a 500, 600 square foot home, no doors. You have uh, curtains that are used for doors. The house, in my opinion, needed uh, cleaning from top to bottom. It needed to be sanitized, including the people living there. Sandra and Christy simply had no life as young girls. Uh, I think abused and uh, neglected for much of their life. No support, no other love at all. I know that from time to time the children would be so hungry that they'd have to go down and, and rummage around in the dumpster. And the children did a lot of the shopping for the home. And by that I mean the cousin would give them a list of what she wanted, and they were ordered to go steal it. According to their mother's attorney, it was a dysfunctional household. What's more, according to the authorities, Sandra suggested that her mother, Elsie, had been under the thumb of her cousin, Linda, who Sandra says had sadistic ideas about disciplining the children. If the child ate something or drank something they weren't supposed to do without this cousin's permission, cousin would make the child consume so many jalapeno peppers that the child would regurgitate, would throw up, vomit. And then the cousin would make the child consume the vomit. If Elsie committed some sin, according to the cousin, she would be the subject of similar treatment. The physical abuse was immense. Uh, it involved everything from uh, burning, uh, boiling water, scalding burns, uh, just very torturous things, and uh, which included uh, the use of a staple gun. Sandra tells the authorities that she suffered deeply from the abuse, but it was her older sister, Christy, who always got the worst of it. And there was another deal, I think, where Christy was picked up by EMS. She'd been beat in the face, the head, and she was left out in the street in the nude. 
and she was hospitalized for some time. She was black and blue. Her entire torso was black and blue. At the time, Elsie claimed that her 15-year-old daughter, Christy, had been beaten up by a boyfriend. Now Sandra, telling her version of the event, says Christy was in fact beaten by their mother. Then, in the final part of the girl's epic tale, she tells authorities that it was after another violent incident when her mother beat her sister with a hammer that Christy fell unconscious and died. Sandra claims she herself was enlisted to help dispose of her sister's body. They dragged the body outside and they washed her down with a water hose and uh, changed her clothes, put her in the back seat of the car. And then that's when they proceed to San Antonio to dump the body. To the actual side, I guess you're looking at maybe at two hours. It's not a coincidence, in, a, in my opinion, that Elsie chose to dump her body at the location of a railroad tracks, uh, which had been considered uh, in San Antonio folklore to have been haunted, that these were haunted tracks. I mean, imagine being a 12-year-old having witnessed your mother kill your sister and to put her in the back seat of a car and go with her uh, 99 miles with the mother to dump the body. Go back to that same house to live. The fear that she had to have been experiencing to, to uh, to know that she couldn't say anything. Now, removed from the House of Horrors for the first time, Sandra is finally talking. But in a cruel twist, the young girl who police know from their patrols around the neighborhood has a hard time being taken seriously. Then you have a police department that doesn't believe her statement because it's too incredible. It's just, it, it, it's not the kind of thing you confront or see very often, and particularly not in a small town. Compounding their suspicion, Sandra's mother and other adults in the house tell police that Sandra is lying. They claim that there was no murder and that Christy has run away with her boyfriend. Police buy the mother's version of the story. They believe that she was lying to cover for her sister Christy. Then, Faced with disbelief and possible retribution from her family, Sandra backpedals. And I guess about an hour and a half in the interview, Sandra recanted and said that uh, everything that she had said was just a lie and she wanted to get her mother in trouble for what she had put her and Christy through. What's more, police don't contact Dr. G's morgue because the only body found at the tracks is male, at least according to the DNA test. So even with the girl's claims, the box of bones in Dr. G's morgue sits unidentified. Is Sandra's recanted claim a call for help? Will Dr. G be able to tell whether the bones are really her sister Christy or whether the girl is lying to get back at her mother? The body was dumped in that exact location where we found this skeleton, and she was around 15. Well, that's a little coincidental. And later on Dr. G, medical examiner, Henry Clark doesn't show up for work. Checking his apartment, his horrified friend discovers why. Can Dr. G tell what happened on Henry's last night? Nearly two years have passed since Dr. G first tried to identify the skeletonized remains of a teenager found at a railroad crossing said to be haunted. And for nearly as long, police have been unable to validate the claim of 12-year-old Sandra Rodriguez, who said her sister was murdered and dumped by those same tracks. But Sandra, now 14, hasn't kept quiet. Encouraged by an aunt, she begins repeating her accusations to anyone who will listen. 
Ultimately, Texas Department of Public Safety is called in to aid police. Special Juvenile Investigator Sergeant Ruben Nolasco pays another visit to Sandra's family. I remember going to uh, Christy's house and I spoke with the aunt there and uh, the feeling that I got was really, really cold feeling. You know, you expect to see photos of, of the children. There's not one single picture hanging on that wall of, of Christy. So I asked her if she had any photographs. And I'll never forget that she went into the kitchen and in one of the cabinets she pulls out a Bible. And in the Bible she had a little picture of Christy. And that's the picture that they gave me. And, and it just, I, I stop and think about it and it just, you know, why would she have a picture of Christy there and not then, you know, in the living room. While the family members still claim that Christy simply ran away, Nolasco starts checking out the details of Sandra's version of what happened. When he does, the trail leads right to Dr. G's morgue. Police called. They said, we have a girl uh, that says her sister was murdered by the mother and that the body was brought up to the railroad tracks where supposedly the spirits live. I said, yes, we have a case like that brought in from that area. And he goes, yes, but I hear, you know, you have a male. I said, well, that's what the DNA showed, but it looked like a female. Certainly bring, bring what you have and let's see if we can identify it. But Dr. G faces an enormous challenge. Christy had never been taken to a dentist. So even though Dr. G found teeth with the remains, there is no record to compare them to. And while Christy had been fingerprinted by police after being arrested for petty theft, the remains have no flesh, no fingerprints to check. Ironically, when the priceless bit of evidence does finally surface, it comes from the hospital file started on Christy after an earlier incident of reported abuse. She'd never been to the dentist, which is the easiest way uh, to, to identify somebody, but she had been in the hospital not very long before she died, several months before she died, in the hospital for being beaten. And they couldn't find any internal broken bones. But they did a lot of x-rays looking for them, and that was to my advantage because they did a lot of skull x-rays. Now, I had her skull, and one of the things we can do is match the pattern of the frontal sinuses. As it turned out, that was the only way we could identify her. In the human skull, the edging and shape of the sinus cavities are unique to every individual. The uniqueness of our sinus that exists is as unique as is a fingerprint or DNA, according to the doctor. You can make a positive identification strictly on that. So we took an x-ray of our skull and compared it to the x-ray that was taken of this girl, and they matched perfectly. Dr. G has her proof. She is certain that what was found at the railroad tracks were the remains of Christy Rodriguez. But what about the DNA test? It said the remains are male. It's a contradiction that could destroy a prosecution's case. The case sat for a long time because I believe some of the uh, prosecutors were afraid to go ahead and prosecute because they, they felt these were all problems with the case. For the case to go to trial, Dr. G would have to explain what went wrong with the DNA test. Whether it was a tissue mix-up, whether it was contamination. And how could the blows of a hammer have been fatal? if there is no evidence of broken bones or trauma. Using x-rays of sinus cavity bones, Dr. G has proven that skeletonized remains found near a fabled haunted railway crossing was in fact the body of a missing, possibly murdered girl, Christy Rodriguez. According to the dead girl's sister, Sandra, Christy died after a beating at the hands of her own mother. Well, this case has always stuck in my mind. I mean, it was just such a difficult case. 
When I heard what the poor girl had to go through uh, in her life, it was very sad. I found it appalling that once the poor girl is dead, they put her in the back seat and drive her into my jurisdiction to be by those railroad tracks. Armed with the positive ID and the accusations from Christie's 14-year-old sister, Sandra, the police arrest Elsie Rivera, Christie's mother. During the trial, Elsie admits beating her daughter with a hammer, but according to her attorney, she was influenced by her cousin, Linda. The cousin and her mother, according to Elsie, were spooky. They uh, dabbled in what some people might refer, refer to as witchcraft. She was terrified of these people. She felt powerless to do anything about it. At trial, Sandra adds details to the account of parental abuse, but paints a more complex picture of her mother's assault on her sister. Yes, her mother did hit her with a hammer and her mother went to sleep, but Christy was still alive and Christy was not screaming or otherwise visibly in distress. Police officers are ordered to arrest Cousin Linda as well. But as the investigation proceeds, the case takes a turn. Authorities have exhausted their leads and can find no other support for bringing a case against Linda. There was nothing that could be proven against her uh, directly to show that she either participated in the murder with, with Elsie or encouraged Elsie to do it. We did, simply didn't have that evidence. Linda would never be charged by police for any of the alleged abuse. But prosecutors proceeded with their case against Elsie. As the case approaches trial, Dr. G turns her attention to the prosecution, attempting to overcome a forensic roadblock. The DNA test initially done indicated that the remains were male. That could prove to be a foothold for the defense. We never figured out what went wrong with that. What happened, we don't know. There are a lot of possibilities and I don't have the final answer on that. Was it a bad test? We know that test was wrong. To prove the first test was incorrect, Dr. G orders another. When we did another test later on, she came out as not having the Y chromosome, that she was a female XX. Mother Elsie goes on trial in June 2000. The key witness is Sandra, who testified that she witnessed the fatal assault and helped dispose of the body. But equally vital on the stand is Dr. G. Medical examiners have to be both scientists and teachers. They must seek out the medical facts and then explain them in simple terms to juries of ordinary citizens. Christie's identity is only part of what Dr. G must prove to the jury. According to Sandra, the only witness to the fatal assault, Christie was beaten repeatedly with a hammer. So why don't the remains have a single broken bone? It's a fundamental question that could make or break the prosecution's case. The skull of Christy had no fracture. How did Christy die as a result of a hammer blow from her mother and, and not have a fractured skull? I'm not a doctor, I can't tell you that. Without any internal organs, determining precisely how Christy died is an impossible question. But incredibly, the same hospital admission that generated the x-rays used to identify Christy comes into play again. That hospital visit, months before her murder, was also as a result of a severe beating, and it too produced no broken bones. And so I had to review very carefully a previous medical chart to see what kind of injury she had and compare that to what we found. And it was very eerie that neither one, any bones were broken, even though she supposedly was beaten about the head and about the abdomen. The only thing that they found was the subcapsular hematoma on the spleen. The spleen, which sits just below the stomach, is a fragile organ responsible for cleaning old blood cells from the circulatory system. The hematoma found by doctors on Christie's spleen was a kind of blood blister that resulted from her first beating. 
I certainly don't have any spleen, but I could opine that another blow to the abdomen uh, certainly could have caused that spleen to rupture. This final piece of evidence is just what the prosecution is looking for, as a ruptured spleen could most certainly trigger a fatal scenario. If you rupture the spleen, the spleen's going to keep bleeding, and you can bleed to death internally. Very common way in some of our car accidents where people can die. The spleen gets torn, and you bleed internally. After Dr. G's testimony, the jury is left to weigh the medical evidence. I think the jury understood that uh, you can die uh, from a hammer without leaving any marks on the bones. And I was very pleased that I think they understood all that. The jury understood it well enough to convict Christie's mother of murder. She was sentenced to 99 years in prison. In Texas law, you can either get life for 99 years as a maximum uh, sentence. In this instance, uh, I thought 99 was a, a particularly a good number, and that's, that's how many miles she drove exactly to the location where she dumped the body. The end of the long saga brings some comfort, but the impact of this emotional case is not lost on those involved. It's a hard lesson, and, and unfortunately, I had to learn it that way. But uh, because of that, it, it made me better at what I do now. That case lived with me for a long, long time until it got resolved. And I'm very thankful for uh, Truth Hunsinger that she was, uh, she had the guts enough to take that on and prosecute it. Coming up, the sudden death of a father of two. So we see blood where it's not supposed to be here. What warning does his cause of death hold for others when Dr. G, medical examiner, continues? No matter what the circumstances, the end of life is traumatic. Homicides make headlines, but sudden death often starts out as a mystery. It's 11 a.m. on a February Monday morning, and the desk of Henry Clark is still empty. It is not like him to be late, and his boss calls Henry at home. He gets no answer. Henry Clark is a well-liked car salesman and the 53-year-old divorced father of two. Like two-thirds of American adults, Clark is overweight, but he's never been diagnosed with a major illness and has never voiced any serious complaints about his health. I think over the past 10 years, I've seen many more uh, obese problems coming through. We're exercising less. We're eating like we're gonna, you know, we're saving it for the famine, and now we're not exercising. It's just, you know, it's bound to cause problems. After his employer calls and gets no response, Henry's girlfriend lets herself into his apartment. On the kitchen table, she finds a bag full of groceries, yet unopened. And then, on the floor near the bed, she sees Henry, half undressed and not breathing. She calls the police. Henry is pronounced dead on the scene. Without any explanation as to how Henry Clark died, the case becomes the business of the Orange County Medical Examiner's Office. Dr. G's office. We received a call from the Orlando Police Department concerning a uh, black male gentleman who collapsed in his apartment and they requested the medical examiner investigator to respond to his apartment complex. Dr. G's field investigator, Jack Cuchilla, is dispatched to the scene and begins to look for clues with an investigator's trained eye. There was nothing that would indicate that we needed to be concerned of any foul play or anything of suspicious nature. Uh, we uh, treated the case as an apparent natural. We just want to make sure that he didn't indulge in too much alcoholic beverage that uh, perhaps contributed to his death or any type of recent meal. 
that possibly would uh, be concerned about an apparent choking uh, effect uh, pertaining to this case. Do I smell Vicks? Are you little wussies? In his investigation, Jack Cuccia learns that the police have turned up a witness and an important clue. A neighbor informs police that on the previous evening, she encountered Henry struggling up the stairs to his apartment, his arms full of groceries. He was dizzy and distressed and complained of a headache. She assisted him in the apartment with the groceries and uh, she had left him alone because he apparently uh, stated that uh, he was okay. Tragically, both Henry and his neighbor were wrong. Henry was in trouble, but what kind? Jack Cuccia brings the body to the medical examiner's office and checks it in for Dr. G. His report, which will help Dr. G begin her investigation, is mostly a list of the few details known so far. So what we have is a 53-year-old black male. He's divorced, he has a daughter. He's a non-smoker, non-drinker, no history of drug abuse, no arrest, lives alone, seems like you know, a clean-cut guy. He's already in complete rigor, which goes along with the, the muscles in his uh, body have tensed up. That goes along with uh, that he's probably been there about uh, at least 18 hours. Dr. G also determines that Henry Clark weighs about 280 pounds. At a body height of 5 foot 10, that means Henry is technically obese. Did his excess weight contribute to Henry's untimely death? So let's see, so he's got some nice dress pants on. Dr. G notes an abrasion on the face. A little abrasion on his nose. In addition, lividity, or collected blood in the face, shows Dr. G that he died face down. Just, you know, gives you a little hint. Dr. G's next discovery is one that's often associated with sudden death. Intravenous drug use. Well, we've got what looks like three little needle puncture marks in his left arm. So that raises, you know, a little bit of suspicion what's going on there. Supposedly no history of illicit drug use. But according to family and acquaintances, Henry Clark had no history of drug abuse and was in normal health. It looks like there's a good chance Dr. G will have to let the internal organs tell the tale of Henry Clark's death. So if we just need one of those. Right. But just before she begins the internal autopsy, she notices something about the thickness of Henry's legs and decides to measure them. When I looked at his legs, they looked asymmetric to me. They don't look the same size. So we're now measuring it to see if I'm off or if I'm accurate. And I'm accurate. The one was 43.5, and this, this calf is 46. Now, one of the things that could be is that he might have, because this one also has some edema, he might have a blood clot in this leg, and this blood clot might have uh, gone up to his lungs, like a deep vein thrombosis, and that would cause a difference in the size of his leg. So 43.5 versus 46, that's pretty significant. In the swollen veins of the legs, a blood clot forms. It can then break free and travel through the bloodstream to the lungs. Once the large clot lodges in the lungs, it blocks blood from flowing into the alveoli, preventing them from picking up oxygen. This lethal blockage of the lungs is called a pulmonary embolism. We can just kind of think about what it could be from his history of complaining about the headache. We've got some asymmetric legs going on down here. Maybe it's a pulmonary embolism and the headache had nothing to do with it. Uh, maybe it's just a heart attack. We, we don't know. And the only way for Dr. G to find out will be with an internal exam. Okay. Right now we've already cut open the abdomen. I don't see anything uh, too remarkable. We'll look at each individual uh, organ. First stop, the heart. Right away, Dr. G can see that this heart is abnormal. This heart is big. It's uh, over 600 grams. Normal heart should be in the upper 300s on him. Oh, I can tell by just his heart, it looks like he's got high blood pressure. So uh, we got one little piece of evidence going along with that. Under the stress of high blood pressure, 
The human heart must pump harder and harder to force the blood through the veins at the proper speed and volume. For the heart, this is like working out at the gym all day, every day. As a result, the heart gradually expands just like a weightlifter's bicep. But this heart does not hold all the answers. Although it has gotten pumped up to nearly twice its normal size, there is no sign of a heart attack. Yeah, I looked already, there was none there. So what killed Henry Clark? When Dr. G medical examiner continues, Henry's case may serve as a wake-up call for the living. It is common, but most of the people make it to the hospital. Fifty-three-year-old Henry Clark complained of a headache while climbing the stairs to his apartment. And as far as the evidence shows, died only minutes later. Dr. G has definitively ruled out a heart attack as the cause of death. But her dissection of Henry Clark's respiratory system is not yet complete. She must still examine his lungs. Given that one of Henry's legs is two and a half inches thicker than the other, Dr. G suspects that he may have died from a pulmonary embolism, a deadly blood clot that forms in the legs and travels to the lungs. The fact that Henry Clark is medically obese is also a risk factor for a pulmonary embolism. But when Dr. G looks at Henry Clark's lungs closely, she is surprised to find no signs of trouble. Well, his uh, pulmonary arteries uh, appear to be fine. And I don't think the next interesting thing will be until we get his head. Henry Clark is becoming a serious puzzle. He has clear signs of high blood pressure, but no sign of heart attack or a blood clot in the lungs. And there's just one clear symptom he described, his headache. He was having trouble getting his groceries up to the second floor and complained to his neighbor he's having a headache. I mean, we don't know why he died. He's just a guy that uh, doesn't look like he's going to the doctor. We don't know anything about his medical history. There's only one place left to look, and if it doesn't have the answers, this death may go unsolved. Okay, so he's ready to go for the head? Okay. Dr. G's assistant, Gene Konis, uses the cranial saw to open the skull. Dr. G then steps in to remove the brain. There at last, at the base of the brain, is her biggest clue, a pool of blood. So we see blood where it's not supposed to be here. We're seeing a little bit of blood leaking out, a hemorrhagic stroke. Closer examination confirms it, a hemorrhagic stroke an artery leading into Henry Clark's brain is weakened from the stress of years of high blood pressure. Eventually, a pinpoint rupture leaks, detouring blood away from its vital mission of carrying oxygen to the brain. It produces symptoms similar to a brain aneurysm, which is a bleed on the outer portion of the brain caused by a defect in a blood vessel. Okay, I think this case is solved. He's got definitely got uh, hypertensive changes. Normally I'll say it's a bleed in the brain consistent with hypertension. Okay. The bleed is without a doubt his cause of death. It is a tragically common event, but not always fatal. It is common. It is common, but most of the people make it to the hospital. They have a loved one that sees them uh, having problems. What makes this man unusual is that he had the a uh, hemorrhagic stroke, intracerebral bleed while he's at home. Nobody saw his symptomatology and didn't rush him to the hospital. But there's one last piece to the puzzle. Drug use can sometimes sharply increase blood pressure. Could the puncture marks on Henry's arms that Dr. G found earlier have something to do with his fatal stroke? You always have to rule out that he's not on a stimulant because stimulants like cocaine, amphetamine, methamphetamine, will cause your blood pressure to increase 
And certainly if he was on that type of drug when he had the bleed, we would have to have said that that played a role because that would have increased his blood pressure. In this case, he tested negative for any type of drug, so we are very confident that this was a natural death. Dr. G will never know the origin of the puncture marks, but with toxicology negative, she is certain that they are not from drug use. Sadly, Dr. G concludes that Henry's high blood pressure was a simple health problem, most likely made lethal by neglect. It's not that it's the mystery of, it, of why he died, it's how a little bit of health care could have helped, really help this fella. A little bit of health care, a little bit of high blood pressure medicine, instructions on losing weight and exercising could have really helped this fella. Now, Dr. G can reconstruct the chain of events leading to Henry Clark's collapse in his bedroom. Events stretching over years. Earlier in his life, possibly when he was quite young, Henry Clark developed high blood pressure or hypertension. Although it is a common ailment, many of its causes remain a mystery. You don't really know what causes it. It's probably a mix of a lot of things, genetic and environmental. Um, environmental meaning things you eat, um, your lifestyle. His weight certainly played a role. People who are obese uh, will have higher blood pressure. Year by year, Henry's high blood pressure erodes the strength of his blood vessels. Beat by beat, his heart strains against the pressure, becoming thicker, bigger. What happens is, over time, there are chronic changes to your small blood vessels because of the high blood pressure. And what they feel happens in the brain is there's probably some of the vessels inside the brain uh, have weakened walls because of this chronic high blood pressure. And eventually, the weakened walls will bulge out and bleed. On the 90 returns from the grocery store, these years of invisible pressure finally reach their most dangerous point. Henry Clark doesn't know it as he climbs the stairs, but his headache is killing him. An artery at the base of his brain bursts, and blood slowly hemorrhages out, depriving the brain of oxygen. While undressing in his bedroom, Henry Clark collapses and never regains consciousness. High blood pressure is a silent killer. He didn't even know he had it. And yet, all of a sudden, you can have this unbelievably devastating effect from something you didn't even know you had. It is an end that came too soon for a tragically simple reason. If there's a lesson to be learned from this case, it's get your checkup. Make sure you know what your blood pressure is, because it is a silent killer. For Dr. G, Henry Clark is symbolic of a problem with health in America. Here's the problem with obesity. When on these really morbidly obese people, their hearts are huge. It's a tremendous pressure on your heart, because you've got the heart of a normal person inside of you, and then all of a sudden, there's miles and miles of extra blood vessels. It's a problem on which Dr. G has a unique and chilling perspective. I've never seen an obese old, old person. If you're really morbidly obese, you're not gonna make it to old age. You have a tremendous number of complications associated with that obesity. Besides the hypertension, the elevated cholesterol, the heart disease, increased risks of all sorts of different kinds of cancer. They just don't make it to old age.